Ladies and gentlemen, we've had uh, two excellent presentations and now have uh, sufficient time here for, for plenty of questions. So uh, there are two microphones that are available. Um, if you could indicate that you have a question or comment uh, by raising your hand, the microphone will come to you. If you wait till you get the microphone before you start, indicate your name, country and organisation and then direct the question to either one or both speakers. Thank you. My name is Commodore Richard Powell. I'm the uh, Defence Advisor in Canberra for the United Kingdom. Uh, first of all, many thanks to both presenters for excellent presentations this afternoon. My question concerns our approach to these problems. Increasingly, as we look at international statecraft, we're using all the levers of power, not just the military lever. We're looking at diplomacy, economic sanctions, this sort of approach. As we address the issues in the Indian Ocean, to what extent we should we take a cross-government approach to these issues and secondly, how should we implement such an approach into a regional security architecture? Probably Professor Lestrange for that one. C can I just clarify what you mean by a cross-government approach? Um, look at Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Development Aid, uh, trade organisations, that sort of thing. Um, well, look, I think, I think the, uh, the premise of the question is entirely correct, and I think that national security uh, in the 21st century is precisely about this issue. In, in, in many ways, the debate is about the limits of it. Um, there is a very traditional definition of national security as a, um, a preserve of, of defence and diplomacy, but I think, as Lee's pointed out, and it's not just confined to the Indian Ocean, the non-military, non-traditional aspects of, of security are perceived by many states around the world as even more important. So. Um, I think this whole issue of what is national security um, is very live. I, I think it is broader than the um, traditional interpretation. I think there is a danger in interpreting it too broadly so that every issue is securitized. Mm. Um, but I think between the two, there is a need to involve um, the various arms of within governments uh, on these issues. If I can give you an example for in an Australian context, there was a time when I first joined government service where uh, domestic policy was handled by domestic agencies and there were two or three agencies that dealt with, dealt with international affairs. Um, and they were the Defence Department, the Foreign Affairs Department, the intelligence agencies and a bit of the Treasury. Now, every agency in the Australian government has an international dimension. The old demarcations between domestic and foreign policy have irretrievably broken down. Um, and the old demarcations uh, between military and non-military dimensions of a nation's security have broken down. So, um, yes, we do need to involve a wider range of people in government and beyond government and these issues. But we also need to make whatever uh, system we create, we need to make it workable. Uh, there is a danger in this that we simply slide down a slope to to completely impractical outcomes where everyone's view is as good as everyone else's. Um, so, um, I, I think the answer to your question is we do need to broaden our uh, engagement. And as I say, I think we need to broaden it outside government as well as inside government. And, and I think um, governments are generally are doing this and it's, um, it's very necessary. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question, the, um, and I agree with all the, those comments, and I, and I also agree with the general sense of the question. Uh, the only thing I think I could add is that whilst here we've talked primarily about security and security architectures and cooperative architectures, there are, of course, a plethora of United Nations type agencies that are already operating in the Indian Ocean as they are elsewhere on issues like in marine environmental security, uh, fisheries, regional fisheries management organisations, those sorts of things. So, as I think we all know, um, whilst um, things in the Indian Ocean are not um, as developed as they probably should be in a cooperative sense, there are a whole lot of, there's a whole framework of issues and agencies already operating. The challenge is how do we bring the key outcomes from that multifarious work together in a whole of government, whole of nation way and particularly target the security issues. And I think, personally, it just underlines the need that I think we've both advocated for um, some 
overarching cooperative mechanisms to try and make sure we capture all this and bring together the key points out of the multifarious activities that are all going on, already going on, noting that nearly all of those activities will be deficient in some way. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Asif Jala from Indonesia. How do we define Indo-Pacific region? <laughs> Sounds like Is it geographical, Sorry? political, <laughs> or strategic? Oh dear, Does it include APEC countries, uh, Latin American countries, <laughs> or Russia for that matter? How do we do that? Thank oh. you. Um, I'm not going to even endeavour to give a precise answer to that question because, as you know well, uh, Ambassador, there are many definitions of Indo-Pacific around the place and uh, there's an old adage of um, you know, where you sit is where you stand and if you sit in Australia and look at the world, the, the idea of Indo-Pacific is a very um, compelling and p powerful one. I would suggest if you're sitting on the east coast of Af Africa, that idea mightn't be so, so compelling. Um, but, I, but I think the main notion from my perspective, that is from a maritime strategic and security perspective, is we need to understand the Indo-Pacific and also the relationships between the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic, Southern Ocean, um, Mediterranean et al in systemic terms. In other words, what happens in the South China Sea in a maritime security sense matters. It affects what happens, you know, affects trade, it affects environment, it affects other things that affect all of us in the Indian Ocean in one way or another in a globalised world. So that, I guess that begs the question of why do we try to divide things at all? Um, but I guess it's about making it workable. But in the Australian sense, um, and I'll hand to my uh, co-panellist here in a moment, but there are, um, you know, the idea of Indo-Pacific has gained currency in, recently in, um, in national policy documents. Um, but again, I don't think it's precisely defined. I think there are a number of definitions around the place. And um, I think if I'm, where I'm currently working in India, they are less imbued with the idea than we are in Australia. Um, because again, if you sit in India or if you sit in um, South Africa or Saudi Arabia and view the world, you, you have you know, a somewhat different perspective. But it is a matter of about how you, how you divide it. And uh, your, your suggestion is probably as good as any other. My idea is to look at it from a maritime security and strategy perspective, which underscores the interconnectivity issues. Thank you. Um, look, all I'd say is that um, uh, whenever regional organisations are established and as they develop, there become demarcation debates about the periphery. Where do you draw the line? Um, and this has been true of APEC. Um, it's certainly been true of the whole G20 debate. I mean, who is in and who is out at the edges? Um, to me, in a way, I mean, that, that's an interesting debate and uh, part of its geography and part of it is interests and part of its values. Um, it's interesting and ongoing, but at the end of the day, I think the essential strategic point um, here is that uh, in my remarks, I was not trying to assert that there is some you know, deep commonality of interest between the literal states um, uh, in Africa and literal states in South America. That is straining reality. But what my point is, is the central strategic point, what happens in the Pacific, particularly among the major powers, will affect what happens in the Indian Ocean. And to, and to quarantine the Indian Ocean or to have some sense of geographic... Um, determinism about it, that somehow we can look at the Indian Ocean in isolation, um, is becoming increasingly irrelevant, um, particularly at the level of the major powers. So, I mean, I think the point is, um, you know, it is a, a source of en endless debate and we'll go on, you know, what are the limits of the Indo-Pacific region? Um, I don't know the answer to it and that will continue, particularly by those who are at the edges or left in or just left out, but the fact is it's happening the dynamics are at work, and I think we do ourselves a disservice by um, looking at either issues or regions in isolation from the bigger dynamics. Any other hands out there? 
Firstly, I have a uh, question for you regarding uh, the risk-based approach to maritime security. I particularly enjoyed that analysis, um, but uh, has there been anywhere else in the world where we've employed that context on an international basis, and how has it worked? Yeah, thanks. Um, one, one of the um, things that, uh, again, Professor Lestrange talked about was um, the need for, or the lack of, and the need for a track two type entity for the Indian Ocean region, similar to CSCAP, Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific, that's been operating for a couple of decades. Uh, it's been interesting, I've personally been involved in CSCAP now for about 15 years, and um, recently had the honour of co-chairing a study group that looked specifically at offshore oil and gas safety and security in the Asia Pacific. And as we went through that work with my uh, colleagues or co-chair colleagues from Singapore and Vietnam, uh, we, we struggled to find a common basis upon which we could have a constructive dialogue and, and an analysis approach, an analytical approach to determining what were the key issues on a, on a regional sense. And um, I'd personally done a lot of work with in the private sector with um, major offshore oil and gas companies and other resource companies, and also increasingly in the public sector here in Australia, and was taken by the way that the risk approaches actually provide a very useful, although not perfect, way of capturing ideas, common ideas, bringing them together and uh, enabling people to analyse them, if you like, dispassionately, without immediately getting into their um, national positions and so on. So we tried that in a CSCAP uh, study group that we held in uh, Vietnam, in Da Nang, a couple of years ago, and it worked pretty well. So the long story short is that that um, approach has now, work, has now working its way through the ASEAN Regional Forum. Uh, it was presented, I, I personally presented it to a ISM, International St uh, Inter, uh, um, Interim Security Meeting, uh, Maritime Security Meeting in Seoul last year. And it's now being taken into the Marine Environmental Protection Working Group work that's ongoing. So um, I guess, you know, like any approach, um, and there, there, there are no doubt others, um, it's as good as the people who are who participate, the analysts, the strength of the analysts, and the data and information they present. But of course, when we're looking at commonalities and common approaches and opportunities to do cooperative things together, if we can find something that's already proven to work in other contexts, in broader contexts, that will help us with that, I think we embrace it and use it so it is starting to get currency, particularly through the ASEAN Regional Forum work. Um, but in a wider sense, the whole concepts of risk and vulnerability are largely embraced by the environmental community. If you read any of the literature on um, and climate change and environmental issues, you'll find it is full of discussions and concepts of risk and vulnerability and how, how it should be managed. So this isn't kind of a new idea, but uh, applying it in a broad um, uh, international multilateral construct like this is relatively new, but I just think it's a way that could help us create a common playing field for discussing issues. Thank you. In relation to that, I guess, uh, uh, Professor Lestrange, in your uh, presentation, you talked about the relationships uh, perhaps between IONS and uh, and other for other organisations, other. Uh, organisations involved in security architecture, what, what role do you think IONS needs to take or strategy should it employ to influence those other organisations? Yeah, look, I think this is a very interesting issue and um, it goes back to the first question, I think, about um, cross-fertilisation and interaction. Um, you know, we don't achieve our um, full potential if we operate in, in silos, whether it be the RIM Association or ions or whatever it is. So, uh, I mean, I think that there are some aspects of state security that, that um, ions is a natural forum for. There are many issues of human security that uh, the Rim Association is more appropriate for. There are some aspects where, um, you know, my own view would be that on issues of climate change, nothing that Indian Ocean states do is going to ameliorate the causes. They may do something to ameliorate the, the effects, but that is a genuinely global multilateral issue. So um, there are these multi-layers involved. Um, 
I'm not sure. I've, I've, I've tried to think this through, and I haven't got a clear view on it, and maybe others do, but the more that there can be uh, intersections between um, uh, organisations like this and the RIM Association, and here we have a situation in which Australia at the moment is, is, is chairing or co-chairing both, um, uh, there's, there are natural synergies, and I think in ways have to be found to actually uh, weave them together in a complementary way. I haven't got the precise solution to that, but um, I think if we tend to see these kinds of initiatives as operating in their own right, there is overlap, and if you look at the priorities coming out of the Rim Association in November, and I think that was the first time the Rim Association had ever managed to put a public declaration out at the end of a meeting. Um, uh, if you look at that agenda and the agenda of IONS, there, there's distinction, but there's overlap. And, and I think there, there needs to be ways in which the remit of this organisation, which is quite precise in many ways, and the remit of um, the Rim Association, which certainly has its limits, but it's broader, there needs to be some mechanism whereby we can actually start bringing these things together, uh, maybe through a CSCAP type initiative or something else more official. I haven't actually got the answer, but I, I know that it's a very good question and that an answer sooner rather than later needs to be found. Thank you. Uh, Gordon Flake with the Perth US Asia Centre here at the University of Western Australia. I do appreciate the many references to CSCAP. I've had a chance from the, the US perspective for the last 10 plus years to participate in that there. But one of the secrets to CSCAP's success is that it had a counterpart in the track one uh, world where they fed into. In other words, they were seen as you know an initiative of the track one. A and one of the challenges I've heard in the discussion today is the lack of institutionalization, whether it's a form of a secretariat in terms of actually who the counterpart of a CSCAP-like organization in IONS would be. And I'd welcome comments from both of the speakers as to, you know, the, the mechanics. You've do both done a wonderful job of laying out the vision and the tasks, uh, but the mechanics are the real challenge. So I'd like to hear your views on that. Do you want me to go first? Or? I'm, I'm happy to comment or... Yeah. Um, no, I think it's a fair point. I suppose at the end of the day, um, I'm a and probably um, may, may be slightly different to Lee here, I, I, I'm a, a quasi-sceptic about a track one organisation in, in, in the Indian Ocean. I mean, a, a, you know, an equivalent to the Asia-Pacific structures for the Indian Ocean. I just think it is, you know, it is a mini UN. You know, it's 50 or 60 states who are, which are extremely diverse in so many ways. I think trying to put that into an umbrella organisation another layer of plurilateralism, I'm not sure would actually work. Now, is that, does that actually mean that a CSCAP type arrangement can't work? I'm not sure. I mean, I think that, um, um, you know, an effectively functioning equivalent of CSCAP addressing Indian Ocean issues um, uh, with appropriate linkages to the existing CSCAP, because there are commonalities as well, as I've said, I think that could feed into you know, um, the Indian Ocean uh, organisations like this and like um, the RIM Association that do exist. I agree the mechanics are important, but I, uh, I think at the end of the day, although an Indo-Pacific strategic framework is, is evolving, there are structures in the Pacific that are not going to be easily replicated in the Indian Ocean. Um, the uh, symbiotic relationship, I think, is increasingly apparent in a strategic sense, but I think the Pacific has has a history to these institutions, particularly after the Second World War, um, with the hub and spokes model and other things, and the, the rise of uh, organisations like ASEAN and, and all of those deep linkages that go back now 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Um, I think trying to recreate that in the Indian Ocean with all its diversity is going to be extremely difficult, but I don't think that inevitably means that you can't have um, a track 1.5, track 2, body that actually does achieve some practical outcomes. But, but Lee's looked at this more deeply than I have. Uh, no, I, I um, look, I, I concur, I think, with the question and also with um, Michael Strange's response is that we shouldn't underestimate the difficulties of, of developing and sustaining, and I underline sustaining, any kind of cooperative mechanisms, whether they be track one or, or track two. 
Um, in the case of CSCAP, just for those of you who are not very familiar with it, I wouldn't like you to uh, run away from here with a clear-eyed optimism about it as an organisation. It's waxed and waned over the decades and um, it relies on, like all of these things, on various nation states entities, um, external affairs and defence organisations supporting it or not. And um, every now and then uh, it has a bit of a victory and, um, and we all um, celebrate when uh, something that, that the Track 2 entity has been discussing actually gets into Track 1. But nonetheless, I think the fact that you have that in the case of CSCAP, I think it's 26 um, nations or entities are involved in that group. Um, they discuss, I mean, their remit is to discuss really tough issues that are often too sensitive or too hard to discuss in track one. So it's populated with senior foreign, uh, former uh, retired senior foreign affairs officials, um, defence people, uh, academics and others. And um, it, it is... Um, in many ways a stimulated and an important um, way of dealing with issues. I, I really think um, it is a significant gap in this part of the world and without having precise answers on how such an entity would be funded or supported if it's not linked to track one entities, because I mean that's where you've got to be, you know, it's no point in groups like IOORG or um, CSCAP studying stuff that doesn't go anywhere. You have to have portals and ways of getting those good ideas or, the, or that valuable research to somewhere where it can affect policy and make a difference. So those connect, connections need to be there. But I think um, we, we need to be uh, clear about the utility of it and it can only be as good as the participants want to make it. I think in the IO case, um, if I were able to advise IORA, noting the IORA membership is in itself somewhat restricted, it's only got 20 member states, and there are many more states that are represented in this room, for example, that ought to have a, um, a role in this. Um, but if I were to recommend or I would advise them, I would suggest that um, setting up and supporting a track two entity should be a strategic priority for them. And indeed, it kind of sits within that um, priority number six on the current agenda, which is about academia and so on. Um, whether or not that gets support and legs, I guess, remains to be seen. So I think I've given you a bit of an imprecise answer because I think it's a tough question, but I think, in my view, getting such an entity up should be a very high priority for people or states and other actors who are serious about getting, uh, making progress with IOR maritime security because that's where I think a lot of the ideas and so on to the intricate um, specific questions uh, would come from in the first place. Thanks, Lee. And, uh Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of this session. Um, certainly from my perspective, uh, both of you have provided an excellent start uh, to this seminar, um, particularly outlining um, the security architecture, provide an overview of that and perhaps where the gaps are, um, and also uh, a risk management approach to, uh, to maritime security. I think both of you have provided some points that uh, working groups under IONS uh, would need to take your papers in detail and perhaps look for uh, so what initiatives and opportunities uh, out of those. Ladies and gentlemen, can you thank both of our speakers, please?